Добрый день, дамы и господа. Мы рады приветствовать вас на втором дне нашей научной конференции по концептуальному искусству. А вчера, по-моему, был очень интересный список докладов, и сегодня, я уверен, он будет не хуже. Первый сегодня выступает госпожа Сара Вилсон, замечательная историка искусства, лектор Института Куртоу в Лондоне, в сферу интересов которой входит главным образом послевоенное искусство, включая, начиная от послевоенной ситуации вплоть до глобального искусства наших дней. Особенно интересно в смысле нашей конференции то, что госпожа Уилсон заинтересована в практиках концептуального искусства, которые относятся не только к сфере англосаксонского происхождения, но и также к тому, что выходит за пределы Первого мира, и в частности происходит из Москвы и России. Поэтому я рад представить ее тему доклада. По-русски она называется «Московская романтическая исключительность. Временный отказ от недоверия». Спасибо and to Boris for all that he did as Mellon visiting professor at the Courtauld Institute in London last term, including bringing us Terry Smith and Anton Vidocle. What a pleasure to see them again. And I realize what a long time it is since I met Katrina Diogot at the After the Wall show in Stockholm in 1999. I deeply regret that in all that time I haven't been able to learn your language, a fact which would inevitably impact upon the talk I'm giving today. I want, bravely, to ask questions about the knowability and the unknowability of what Boris baptized Moscow con Romantic Conceptualism in the review IEA in 1979. And I'm very proud that Igor Chelkovsky, who generated that review uh, and put this wonderful historical document into the world, is with us today in the auditorium. I must confess that somewhere around 2005 to 6, I had what the French call a coup de foudre, love like a lightning blast, when I discovered collective actions, performances in the snow, and I attended Boris's talk for his Total Enlightenment show in Frankfurt, where he described the physical experience of going out into the snowfields where these actions took place, the return and the months-long discussions and documentations which constituted other dimensions of the work parts of which will be evoked this June in the Russian pavilion at the Venice Biennale. I've also seen much of Monastirsky's work at Rutgers University. Today, we are informed by Groys's new anthology of Moscow conceptualism texts, History Becomes Form, and Matthew Jesse Jackson's experimental group, both published in 2010. Evidently, all art shown, all texts read, exist in the now and contemporary interpretations and re-readings are always valid. Boris is the communist, spoke po sorry, the communist postscript, 2006-2009 uh, in English, is also, one could argue, a contemporary work which adds its voice to a chorus of thinkers, Alain Badieu, Jacques Rancière, Slavo Žižek, Giorgio Agamben. Yet he alone has the special legitimation, I was there, to turn a lived Soviet experience into a contemporary work, to use the USSR as model or anti-model, or model slash anti-model in all its strangeness, in all its exceptionality. The very fact that IER was trilingual, produced near Paris, distributed among expatriate communities, and reporting on events from New Jersey to Tel Aviv, should alert us to the special nature of the image we are seeing on the screen. In this company, I can neither argue nor contend, but simply suggest that we are experiencing today not only the enjoyment of what I call Moscow conceptualism's delay in snow, but a snow-cladding operation, an operation which brings us back constantly to a magical, originary moment of vastness, isolation, 
revelation, and of course, political impudence, purity and danger, an irresistible combination. We, we can plunge back into the past simply by going back to the world of black and white. My title, Moscow Romantic Exceptionalism, uses the French model, uh, France as a cultural exception, l'exception culturelle française, to ask whether, in non-Russian literature at least, and of course I can't read any Russian literature on the subject, Moscow Romantic conceptualism, as baptized by Groys in IR in 79, should be allowed to escape all art historical norms. My discussion is largely based on what I see as the period of its originary texts, those published in IER from 1979 to 86. To explain, this is to explain what the cultural exception is. The post-1945 period of American dominance in Europe involved promoting American culture as well as economic deals as part of the Marshall Plan for Reconstruction. The French increasingly called upon what they regarded as their cultural exception to justify special government subsidies, for example, for the French film industry, which otherwise would have been swamped by Hollywood. The wine versus Coca-Cola wars were not merely about difference, but a fear of the contamination of French culture. By introducing this model and putting vodka into the equation, the burning liquid assessed through, assessed through its purity and transparency, the drink for the snow that banishes cold and pain, I want to ask why Moscow romantic conceptualism wishes to ring fence its ex exceptional status. What is its fear of contamination when perhaps, or rather surely, it embraced various different practices in parallel with those in Europe, Eastern Europe and America? The delay in snow requires, I argue, not belief in its miraculous genesis and now decades-long resurrections, but what the romantic poet Coleridge called a suspension of disbelief. Uh, to make his black and white film in 1968, the American artist Robert Morris walked mirror in hands through a snowy landscape somewhere near New, New York. Art history is a comparative practice. It requires a historical imagination, not to say forms of personal projection. Beside what the French and the Russians would call its scientific aspects, the amassing of primary documents, secondary material, witness accounts, there is the business of representing, making present, premised upon a certain notion of truth to history. This might be creating a lecture, a narrative, a placing, a critique. Interpretation requires comparison across time and space since the very origins of art historical practice, which were linked with the Renaissance and Renaissances, and long before the juxtapositions made by figures such as A.B. Warburg or André Malraux. Like Malraux's book title, Le Musée Imaginaire, The Imaginary Museum or Museum Without Walls, Groys's title, History Becomes Form, is an operation. It puts history into the now, yet it posits certain forms only as the history. In the north, it snows. This performance by the Yugoslavian artist Tomislav Gotovac, Shooting L, was apparently made as early as 1964, in the woods, in the snow, in the presence of a group of friends, and a skilled photographer. The work was shown in Jörg Heiser's seminal exhibition, Romantic Conceptualism, in 2007, and in Gender Check in Warsaw in 2010. I also can't resist putting together, I hope you'll like this, um, a collective action shot with Lucio Fanti's 1975 painting, Poetry Readers in the Snow. In his case, a fantastic projection in oil paint created in France with no possible knowledge of the Moscow group. 
The first numbers of Aya magazine showed Francesco Infante's very beautiful images made with mirrors in the landscape, photos taken in color as well at the time, and his breathtaking Malevich experiments. The elements of fun, playfulness, sorry, playfulness, even a banalization, bringing Malevich from his cosmos flat onto the ground might have been more evident at the time of making. I juxtapose here Robert Smithson's Utican mirror displacements, 1969, on the left, with Infante's image from IER number one uh, on the right, now reproduced in full color on his website, which significantly, incidentally, names his wife as collaborator. The Invisible Wives, this includes, incidentally, Joseph Kosuth's Invisible Wife, the Invisible Wives, um, of the heroic period of conceptualism East and West, so many artists are only just beginning to receive the attention they deserve. For Boris Groys, inevitably, this juxtaposition is obvious, and he insists upon the fact of the circulation of both European and American art magazines in Moscow. Yet the over 10-year time lag poses questions that cannot be answered without more primary research. And I'd like at this point to acknowledge the help and support and fantastic discussions I'm having with my research students, many of whom do speak Russian, some of whom are in the audience today, who are really helping me with this project and actually, from the point of view of yet another generation, engaging with primary research materials. Infante, a mirror in the snow. So Infante finally joins Robert Morris with a mirror in the snow. How banal is this exercise? Of course there are parallel phenomena, different experiences and different mindsets at stake. But on the level of big narratives, the atom bomb or men in space, for example, surprise parallels, things simply popping up in the snow or the desert do not exist. Certain conclusions are obvious. Yet even the story of how Infante procured his Western cameras and the Soviet trade fair installations he worked on, which allowed him to steal his famous um, mirror foil, are utterly fascinating for me, so different from Robert Smithson's better known stories. But the exceptional nature of, the, the exceptional nature of every piece of art is of course related to its production at a certain moment of the intersection of time and space the synchronic and diachronic axes. This is Eric Bulatov's Natasha, 1978 to nine, also reproduced in IR. I am particularly interested in the conjunction in the 1970s between conceptual art and the hyperrealist movement in painting. If we date classic conceptualism to the mid 1960s, its official arrival at the Paris Biennale was in 1971, together with American hyperrealism. The conjunction conceptualism hyperrealism was repeated again at the famous Castle Documenta of 1972. Incidentally, the authoritative New York October Group anthology Art Since 1900, which astonishingly forgets Kabakov, called this moment the triumph of conceptual art in Europe, i.e. American conceptual art, obliterating hyperrealism as a movement altogether. Europe, in fact, produced several forms of realist painting after 1945, first continuing a realist expressionist tradition, think of Lucian Freud, secondly, with its own strong version of Stalinist social realism, especially in France. Later, there was a riposte to American pop artists like James Rosenquist, combined with a con response to contemporary new wave film, using images projected with slides or an epidioscope in the mid-1960s. These so-called narrative figuration movements answered hyperrealism, perceived as ultimate American triumphalism, with their own often aggressively political work, the artists ranged from communist to neo-Marxist to Maoist. Many participated in the huge German touring show, Art and Politics, held to mark Lenin's centenary celebration in 1970. By 1977, the exhibition New Soviet Art at the so-called Biennale of Descent in Venice showed works from 1950 to the present, 
with Bulatov's horizon on the catalog cover. Every single work had been ex ex illegally exported over the last few years. Collectors were based in Prague, Paris, cities in Germany or Italy, and New York. This was five years before the talk Photorealism in Eric Bulatov's painting at the Photography and Painting Conference in Moscow in 1982. Yet never once have I encountered any contextualizing of work about Bulatov or a description of when he started to project images in order to paint like his European contemporaries. These, this work is evidently based on a photograph, as you all agree. Bulatov's Natasha in orange projects vibrantly towards the viewer. The monumental sculpture in the background is ideologically almost irrelevant. Lucio Fanti, who I come back to, who showed in the German Art and Politics show of 1970, was already perplexing the French and Italian communist apparatchiks with his own critical pieces. This fog of ideology, 1974, turns us from snow to the metaphorical fog surrounding not only Soviet, but European communist discourse at a particularly intense time of doubt and disarray. While Brezhnev's thaw marked a certain freedom in stasis, so well conveyed by the frozen motion of Bulatov's figures, this is Boris Groys's happy period, incidentally, the world outside the USSR was rocked in 1974 by the publication of Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago. Fanti's poet in the fog, Mayakovsky, 1975, expresses a melancholy of loss, as well as a certain humor, a disjunction, which the political philosopher Louis Althusser, writing on Fanti's work in 1977, described as the implacable décalage, an indication that the times were out of joint. Let us now turn not to a conceptual artist, but to the Swiss-Romanian Daniel Spöri. We find him, yes, out of doors again, somewhere in the countryside near Bern, Switzerland, in 1971. Now, just shut your eyes, please, and think of Kabakov's writings. This is Spöri. I wrote notes on the direct correlation of the height of a culture to the quantity of its garbage. The recycling of trash as raw material for paper, glass, rag, and rugs. The laws concerning recycling. The increase of the value of trash as it ages. The legal status of flotsam and jetsam. Social garbage and expulsion from society. Trash as a breeding place for microbes, but also on microbes as representatives, representatives of trash and transformers of cellulose into sugars a hypothetical future study of the archaeology of our epoch. I found shards of glass to be full of excitement, rusty knobs to be full of recollections. Dead flies could break my heart. Flies, as you know in Moscow, if you're familiar with Kabakov's work, could also break his heart. Daniel Spöri, uh, just to explore this world before Kabakov, this is a corner of the Spöri restaurant, 1968. We see kitchen stuff, intimacy, the suggestion of conversations, and the joke of the whole room or whole world as a ready-made, together, of course, with the idea of an avant-garde work that is entirely kitsch. In Nice, one presumes, where the critic Pierre Rest and his French Nouveau Realiste new realist movement had its southern outpost, this is the south of France, the Fluxus-connected performance artist Ben stands beside Spöri's ta Ben's table, 1961, 1961, for once hung on a wire, not on the wall. This is the actual work, and you can see it's full of rusty drawers, old slippers, all sorts of bits and bobs, lots of decaying things. Spöri's wall installation, 1961, shows again the kitchen pots and pans. Oh, this is, this is the next one, yeah. His wall installation of 61 shows again the kitchen pots and pans, even the art of his friends, all imbued with the post-Kurt Schwitters, post-Robert Rauschenberg, post-Second World War poor junk aesthetic of the times, where everyday life, far more than Marcel Duchamp, was the watchword. 
Moscow conceptualism unsurprisingly lacks the Duchamp fixation of its English and American counterparts. Here in the Tretiakov Gallery, you can see Tureki Mulkipi's assemblage of 1974, very precisely a Soviet experiment in this mode. And as Andre Erofeyev has confirmed to me, there was much interchange between uh, France and the Soviet Union at this time, including, of course, the coming and going of his famous writer's brother. He also spoke to me about the French connections of Mikhail Roginsky, whose Red Door, 1965, 1965, that famous date, is a sort of Soviet ready-made that precedes the Sovietized, expanded, one could argue, nouveau realism of Kabakov. <clears throat> and here we have Kabakov. Uh, sorry, I want to go back there. Yeah, um, yeah sorry. Uh, um, so I'm back on the Red Door. What is the epistemological difference with a European contemporary? In IR 3, 1981, we discover that Roginsky read Platonov at the time and was struck by the writer's alienation from what surrounded him, by his idealism, his existence in an abstract world, his sadness. It seemed the whole point of life, Roginsky concluded, was to sacrifice and to serve. After walls, doors, and floors, Roginsky started painting cans of food, what he saw as ugly contemporary objects. And here you have a Kabukov installation of 1981 that's also part of the Tretiakov co co collection. This piece by Kabukov is contemporary with these reflections. And we notice the tins, we notice here, amongst all the other debris, the tins with labels and instantly see the connection with the tins of Dmitri Prigov, another beautiful IER illustration. Prigov is, of course, a multifarious figure whose work at this moment is fascinate, fascinatingly suspended between two worlds, Kabakov and Junk on the one hand, and on the other, the worldwide movement of concrete poetry. Incidentally, Stephen Bann, who participated in that Global Conceptualism 1999 catalog, was the person who 30 years earlier in 1969 wrote the first global anthology of concrete poetry. Junk installations, concrete poetry, one would think these were rather different things. Just as Clement Greenberg combined the utterly diverse abstract practices of the American Jackson Pollock, the Russian emigre Mark Rothko, the Judaic minimalism of Barnett Newman, and the post-European figurative heritage of William de Kooning under the label abstract expressionism, so Moscow conceptualism, even Groyce's new term communist conceptualism, are terms which are strategic operations. This is a photograph from number eight, the literary number of Aya, of the poet Vlesevold Nekrasov. And please excuse me for my pronunciation, of course. So this is the poet, and this is something, a poem by Eugène Gomriga, Silencio, in indicating the concept of silence in this architectural way with language, which um, Nekrasov himself discovered first in 1964, 1964, in the Soviet journal, okay, Istrania Literatura, Foreign Literature. So, um, <clears throat> and here are Prigov's concrete poems on the left, a back page of Aya. Evidently, Prigov's genius was to pervert Soviet slogans, just like those collective action banners in the snow. And thanks to Igor's um, insistence on trilingual translation, I know that the top uh, piece, top left-hand piece, for example, instead of having a poem about silence or moonlight or snow, actually says, we are grown by the party with the word Stalin erased each time for the joy of the people. But simultaneously with this, we have, of course, Bulatov's photo-based painting of Vesovlod Nekrasov, the poet, whose photograph you just saw. <clears throat> so as we see, the photorealism of Bulatov's Nekrasov coexists with Prigov's late, late experiments with concrete poetry, brand new, perhaps, for the Soviet audience. Again, we encounter both lateness and transformation, 
but also one could argue in Bulatov the idea of hyper-realistic conceptualism, a concept, conceptualisme hyper-realisé, which was formulated in 1974 in a show putting conceptual and hyper-realist art together that was held in both Aachen and Paris. Here again I show just for your interest the concrete poetry of the famous American minimalist sculptor Carl Andre on the left from Map of Poetry, Sculpture, Words, 1966. Remember the Kossuth date, possible date, 1965 and a piece on the right by a Swiss concrete poet and friend of Daniel Spöri. Again, this practice of juxtaposition helps us see the concrete poet, poetry experiments by Rima Gelovina, for example, published in AIA. This is her Paradise Purgatory Hell game of 1978, in which she puts the names of famous poets and people like um, Trotsky, Shakespeare, and so forth. You can choose whether you pick them up and put them in paradise, purgatory, or hell, but obviously this is a very, very subtle, or in fact not even very subtle, metaphor for the arbitrary sending of people away um, from, from maybe the purgatory of Soviet everyday life into the hell of the camps, or vice versa in certain people's interpretation. Um, <clears throat> How poignant it is to see Rima Gerlovina here, photographed for the IER magazine. She was a brilliant Slavic language expert and philologist in her Moscow studio, I think, prior to her emigration. IER number no. 4, 1982, reported the, the Russian Samizdat art exhibition held in New York, designed and curated by Rima with her husband, Valerie Gerlovin. In Ronald Reagan's America, celebrated with the art of Julian Schnabel and Keith Haring, you can imagine that this went down like a lead balloon. Yet 10 years earlier, so now I'm zooming back 10 years from, from um, <clears throat> uh, uh, the conjunction of concrete poetry, open air happenings, and the absorption of straight conceptual art practices may be seen just for example in Poland. Very quickly I'm showing you here, and again I can't pronounce anything properly, Andrzej Dzionewski's Other Readings, 1972, in which he's labeling junk and kitchen vessels, as you can see, with little concrete or, or not poetry labels, and the piece is referring in its label to the love song of Alfred J. Prufrock by T.S. Eliot and making a joke about Goethe at the same time. This is an outdoor piece uh, by Yaroslav Kosolovsky at the eighth, eighth meeting of artists and theoreticians in Ozieki in 1970, where the words imagination zone uh, on signboards should be placed, he said, everywhere in institutions, offices, railway station buildings, street squares, by the riverside, by lakes, land, in the sky, uh, recommended, as he says, for mass production and universal distribution. And last but certainly not least, Eugenius Smolinski's work called Biography on the left with a shovel, which I'm juxtaposing in terms of its strategy with Joseph Kasus' obviously very famous one and three chairs, that work we discussed so much yesterday. And of course, if I'd had Terry Smith's slide of Kasus' shovel, it would have been even more pertinent. Of course, um, I cannot read the text in this piece on the top left, and therefore, I can't comment on, firstly, the localization of the piece, i.e. what makes it Polish or relevant to the contemporary social or political scene, and secondly, to what extent it is what Harold Bloom would call a misprision, a deliberate misreading which allows a younger artist to absorb and go beyond a powerful forebear. There might also, of course, be elements of humor and irony here which distort the deliberately deadpan straight dictionary definition appropriated by Kossuth with all its lexical complexity, its evocation of sound, of reading, the arbitrary connections between sign and signifier, and so forth. I want to change course now and simply comment on another important yet strange coincidence between East and West, 
which also belies, I think, the idea of the exceptional nature of the preoccupations of Moscow Romantic conceptualism. And this again links up with the historical enterprise of IR, which not only commented on contemporary art events, but excavated a history of uh, pioneers such as Malevich, but also Pavel Filinov, for example, for contemporary readers together. And this was something that was very new in France, despite its limited readership in France or in England, for example, of um, not only Moscow's socialist realism, but military painting. However, back to this bizarre, or is it bizarre, conjunction between Malevich and Stalin. This is one of the photos of the burial, and this is Malevich's tomb. Ayar's magnificent number four, with its article on, on the Malevich complex and photographs of Malevich's funeral, which circulated in the constructivism-hungry Soviet Union, also contained a piece, as I say, on the art of socialist realism. Remember that the first number of Ayar in late 1979 coincided with the Paris-Moscow ex exhibition at the new Centre Pompidou Museum in Paris. Indeed, a left-wing protest, including a fake Malevich coffin, was brought into the museum and up that famous escalator. The return show, Moscow Paris, was held from June to October at the Pushkin Museum in 1981. Its supremely important role, including its rich catalog, at a crucial pre-perestroika moment, has been underestimated. And I wonder how many of the younger people in this room have seen the Moscow version of that catalog. I certainly haven't. But on to another IER image, which puts together the Malevich uh, with Stalin. And I'm waving here a number of Art Presse, December 1977 from France, which has got a huge dossier on Malevich and sup suprematism. And the cover, as you can see, says, is Stalin still alive? Andrei Siniavsky first denounced Soviet socialist realism in the West as early as 1959. When he went to Naples in 1976, he was horrified to find Stalinism alive and well, as you can see, 5353, date of Stalin's death, 5376, long live the dictatorship of the proletariat. This was because through 76, there was, and it took this enormous, almost 20, over 20 year gap. The French Communist Party at least decided in 1976 that the proletariat was not going to take over the world and decided to abolish it as one of its founding principles, which upset many people, including Althusser. However, Siniavsky's dismay at Italian Stalinism is very strong. Um, <clears throat> So as I said, there's exactly the same thing here at exactly the same time, this 76, 77 moment, when the fact that, that Stalinism is alive and well in France and Italy is, is to some very dismaying. I feel that this constant conjunction, Malevich-Stalin, had more than a little to do with the genesis of Groys's Gesamtkunstwerk Stalin project, Stalin the Demiurge, fulfilling the constructivist desire for the world as a total work of art. Yesterday, Boris talked about artists and intellectuals choosing their responsibilities. In the West, at least, and after the euphoric Lenin exhibitions and celebrations, including one where this Lenin portrait of, by Brodsky was shown in Paris's Grand Palais, the enthusiastic intellectuals of the strong, humanistic, yet Stalinist, totally Moscow-controlled communist parties of the West were full of embarrassment, guilt, conflicted, ugly feelings when Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago was published, a strong contrast to Boris's angelic disavowal of yesterday. This is Fanti again. He's not a very well-known artist, but I've just been to the opening of his retrospective in the south of France, and his works, you if you like, you can see as of symptoms of work that actually was produced in the West with this constant Soviet reference. Lenin's on chair in small meat 1917, 1975 is the title. Fanti's post-Solzhenitsyn version of Brodsky's Lenin was a work one could, a work one could argue of Western conceptual hyperrealism, expresses the sense of potential loss caused by Solzhenitsyn's book, the destabilization of communist faith in Italy, 
and the loss of the father, the patriarch, the loss of the communist family. If any of you know anything about the communist family of intellectuals in France, in Italy, uh, in uh, South America, you all know exactly what I mean. Um, <clears throat> and Fante's photo montage based Bathers Near Moscow shows the city of dreams of Western communists, aureoled with its strange light of threat and waning promise. Conceptual hyperrealism is this Parisian romantic conceptualism. While I'm fascinated by the political and cultural power of Western Stalinism, particularly in France and Italy, these so-called counter-societies of communists in countries completely reconstructed after World War II with American money, I feel always in Russia that Stalinism and post-Stalinism is perceived to be your own personal problem, which of course it was not. The Western Romantic conceptualists, if I could rebaptize the artists of the European narrative figuration movement, all detested American hyperrealism, hardcore. This is the real thing, Richard Estes' Apollo 1968. Its very title, a reference to the American manned lunar spaceflight. It shows all the commodities in its advertising that the USSR lacked and all the vulgarity of the Coca-Cola world that the French despised. There was always a consciousness in both worlds, in France as well as America, I'm sorry, in France as well as the USSR, of their own exceptionality, their own economic and political inadequacy at the same time. Yet the softer focus, more innocent American works, such as David Kessler's Jim, Wayman, Peter, end of roll vacation slide. You can see how the camera has, has fizzled out at the end of a whole roll of things, which he's carefully painted by hand, on a projected image, of course, uh, has, much, uh, has parallels with the softer photo-based realism that moves, one could argue, within a, this is a painting. I'm, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the name of the artist. Oh, so yeah, exactly, sorry. Which moves within a generation, one could argue, towards the photography of a Boris Mikhailov. Even in the IER period, however, the alternative sharp focus realism, a term, an American term from Sidney Janice's gallery, um, based on American-inspired commercial advertising and Technicolor film, was being used by Ilya Kabakov. But with Kabakov's texts, both pieces of everyday life and parodies of Soviet bureaucrac bureaucracy, we come to Groys's claim in his brilliantly rhetorical communist postscript about the linguistification of society. The communist revolution is the transcription of society from the medium of money into the medium of language, I quote him, a linguistic turn at the level of social practice. He goes far beyond in this claim, of course, Benjamin Buchlow's famous thesis about conceptual arts mirroring of the aesthetics of administration in the West. I quote again, in Soviet communism, every commodity beca became an ideologically relevant statement, just as in capitalism, every statement becomes a commodity. One could eat communistically, house and dress oneself communistically, or likewise non-communistically, or even anti-communistically. This means that in the Soviet Union, it was in theory just as possible to protest, against, to protest against the shoes or eggs or sausage than available in the stores, as it was to protest against the official doctrines of historical materialism. This is my favorite quote, isn't it? Of course, because it's rather concrete. Uh, they could be criticized in the same terms because these doctrines had the same original source as the shoes, eggs, and sausage, namely the relevant decisions of the Politburo of the Central Committee of the CPSU. And one of my poor students who had to comment on this in, ex on, in an exam is in the audience. When I gave this to my students, a statement to think about, one of them reposted very brilliantly, I must say, so bravo to whoever it was, with Coma and Melamid's Eat art performance with Pravda, with Pravda in 1977. This is Coma and Melamid eating Pravda newspaper. You can understand what that means. This both brilliantly confirms and, of course, totally refutes Boris's claim with their characteristic spirit of the carnivalesque. I, I am coming to a conclusion. I'm not looking at my watch. When Soviet artists emigrated, mostly part of the huge Jewish, Jewish exodus from the USSR that peaked in 1979, 
just before the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, their reception in the West was not what they'd expected, nor the reception of Moscow conceptualism. Its romantic dimensions were ignored. The movement and its artists were disliked by white Russians, of course, disliked by the Western right as they represented the left, disliked by the Western communist Marxist left for their anti-communism. I came uncertain and afraid, full of clever hopes, said Gerlovina. And of course, she had a very, very tough time. Boris has interestingly claimed that the recognizability of Stalin, uh, practically only the recognizable emblem of the USSR, like Warhol's Mao's and Marilyn's, is why he features so insistently in post-emigration works like Leonid Sokov's Stalin and Marilyn of 1992. Boris also spoke of all Soviet boys' Oedipal dilemma, although, of course, he didn't use the word Oedipal, how to be as great as Stalin, and the necessary masochistic admission of defeat. Could one not see his Stalin, the total work of art, written in exile and published in 1988, as partaking of the same logic? Coma and Melamed, Stalin of the, and the Muses, uh, is, of, is, of course, the image, again, with Stalin on the cover, uh, sorry, which is the image, which is, uh, which is the cover of um, the translation in 1992 of Groys's Stalin, the total work of art. Even after inevitable Cold War defeat and the, uh, and the beginning of perestroika, the USSR kept up its magnificent panoply of power, its image of beauty, masculinity, cruelty, and this is a fabulous image of the 25th Congress of the CPSU in 1986. I wish to argue finally that the loss of the Soviet Union is not only that of an empire of the word, as Boris claims, but also a visual empire and an empire of light, from the black and white checkerboard and rays around Lenin to the light of Bulatov's paintings which switch, which switch incessantly 30 years later between Soviet landscapes, their roots in 19th century traditions, and the black and white of Malevich. And both these images are from a catalog of Bulatov's work from 1990 to 2003. I'm interested then in the repetition compulsion of Moscow and con conceptualism. Uh, you see here as well Coma and Melamid's work with Malevich 1990 to one. And here, blue noses, ever undead Lenin writhing around, normally in little cardboard boxes. <clears throat> but the light and color in this cracked, dirty, beautiful world of Soviet corridors, with its promise of the garbage of the past, is to me more telling than blue noses' own work of art. Or the dark brown wire filled, whoops, sorry, where's the palm? or the dark brown wire-filled ba basement staircases, part of the Soviet Union as total installation that is so rapidly disappearing. It's more beautiful than works than, uh, than its own artworks. This is Blue Soup's way out, incidentally, of 2005. Indeed, Dmitry Olachinsky this week predicted the disappearance of Russia as we know it today, not this old Russia, within the next 10 to 20 years. Of course, you can have lyric poets of disappearance, uh, to use uh, choose Martinez's idea from yesterday. And of course, this is wonderful Olga Chernycheva's Rusty Fence of 2004. With this disappearance, there will just be the last survivors, those who can recall the Soviet mindset, as opposed to those who can read Groys's communist, spoke, uh, communist postscript. In England, a fortnight ago, at our Tate Modern Conference, Expanded Conceptualism, this is very quick, this might end, I compared the French Catholic performance artist Michel Journiac, who performed Catholic mass in an art gallery, using a sausage of his own blood for the host, and that's a picture of him, and that's the, uh, this is the, uh, the uh, penultimate image, with Robert Morris, this is Journiac's uh, um, sacred wafer on the right and a complex work by Morris on the left. With Robert Morris, the, the once conceptual artist whose American attitude was so different from Journiac's Catholicism, whose American attitude was based on the pragmatic philosophies of John Dewey and Charles Pierce. I asked, as Journiac did, 
Does one believe in Catholic transubstantiation, bread into body, wine into blood? Or could one posit, as in Morris's work on the left, just by a legal statement, that all the aesthetic qualities of a work of art had been withdrawn. On the left at the bottom, you see a work of art by Morris, which he gave to a collector, and the collector didn't pay him for it. And then he made this new thing at the top, which has got a legal statement saying, I withdraw all aesthetic qualities from the piece. I end with the work in reference to these last two questions I've asked, um, which I consider paradigmatic work of Moscow conceptualism by Oleg Vasiliev, published, of course, in Aya magazine. To say, in contradistinction to the pragmatic Robert Morris, there is no aesthetic withdrawal. This piece is, emblem is, embl is emblematic of the fact that in a society where man owned nothing, this society without market upon which Boris insists so much, he in fact owned everything, a society of light as well as of the word, it's a post-constructivist interrogation of a post-perspectival space going back into the natural world. An angel zooms towards us through a snow-covered forest, uh, itself the white paint of a Malevich, or zooms backwards like Benjamin's angel of history. Um, <clears throat> Groys puts the USSR into a philosophical sieve, separating the grain from the chaff, then distilling the grain like a vodka maker into burning clarity. His lucidity, his transparency, versus what he has called the dark pa paradox, is the problem. The IER papers at Rutgers University, in fact, tell us not only about the danger of smuggling texts, the labor of writing critical and art historical texts, the photography, the translation, but also the bickerings, jealousies, protectionism, even very Soviet uh, anti-Semitic antagonisms and strategies of denunciation. Its literary number, in particular, sketches the tragic backgrounds of many contemporary or just dead writers. A poet like Valam Tikhonova Shalomov, for example, who spent his whole life in a series of labor camps, his work unpublished, and died in a psychiatric care home. Yet all now is distilled. We confront an era now strange to us, to nearly all of us in this room, the mindset distanced in time as well as space. I want to leave you with Boris's remarks from his first preface, to be read with the requisite belief and the requisite suspension of disbelief. Above all, what Coleridge saw as a necessary adjunct to this suspension of disbelief, poetic faith, Boris. In England and America, where conceptual art originated, transparency meant the explicitness of a scientific experiment clearly exposing the limits and the unique character of our cognitive faculties. In Russia, however, it is impossible to paint a decent abstract picture without reference to the holy light. The unity of collective spirit is still so very much alive in our country that mystical experience, of course, he may be very ironic and denunciatory in this text, but nonetheless, so very much alive in our country that mystical experience here appears quite as comprehensible and lucid as does scientific experience. Unless it culminates in a mystical experience, creative activity seems to be of inferior worth. If Kabakov is the Soviet Union's, indeed the world's, Dostoevsky of the 20th century, in the light of the complex polyphonic narratives with which he fills his abandoned spaces transported and recreated in the West, then I suggest that Groys, with his poetic philosophical distillations, is the Soviet Union's John Milton, the poet whose paradise lost about Satan's rebellion against God became the retrospect retrospective epic of the very bloody and very messy English revolution of the 1640s. Of course, the question here is one of both philosophy and faith and poetic faith. I read you always, Boris, as you know, with poetic faith. Thank you.